Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Bridge. We are glad that you've chosen to worship with us. Today we are concluding our sermon series that we are calling Blessed. And throughout the last six weeks or so, we've been considering what is it that constitutes a blessed life? And one of the many things that we've learned is that blessings come to us as we participate in the kingdom of God. Now, that's a phrase that's not familiar to everyone. Thankfully, Scripture helps us understand it clearly. Perhaps uh, the most clear explanation of the kingdom is found in the Gospel of Matthew in a portion of Scripture that we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew 5 through 7. We're going to be there this morning in Matthew chapter 5. If you want to go ahead and turn there and put your finger there as a placeholder. Ushers are coming with Bibles. If you need one, just raise your hand. They'll be glad to give it to you, and that can be a gift from us to you. Glad for you to have that. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus helps us understand that the kingdom is not primarily... um, a kingdom with geographical boundaries. It's not a spatial thing. Neither is it a code of conduct. It's not a a list of rules that we are to follow, but rather the kingdom is a spiritual reality. The kingdom exists wherever Jesus rules and reigns. Where his rule and reign is in effect, that's where the kingdom is. And in the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, otherwise known as the Beatitudes, Jesus provides for us eight descriptors. Eight descriptors of what a kingdom citizen should look like. If we are in the kingdom, we have a relationship with the king. And we are to model our behavior after his. His values, his priorities, his opinions, his way of doing things. And in the first 11 verses of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives us eight descriptors of kingdom people. Today we're going to pick up the last of those, beginning in Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men." You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for these last several weeks that we've had to delve deep into your word, to come to a new and more challenging understanding of what it means to be kingdom citizens. And we pray, Lord, that you would seal these lessons to our hearts, that they would not merely become one more bit of information gathered, but rather your word would shape us and mold us and conform us to the image of your son, Jesus. As we turn our attention now to the last of the Beatitudes, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come, just as you promised, to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if we've learned anything the last six weeks, we have learned that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world are diametrically opposed, completely antithetical to one another. The world has zero interest in poverty of spirit, in meekness, in mercy, in hungering and thirsting for righteousness, in purity of heart. Those, Those sorts of things don't even make the register 
for the kingdom of the world. But for the kingdom of God, they are everything. They are the priority. The kingdom of this world is broken. It's broken and it's not going to be fixed. It's not going to be fixed anytime soon. The entire reason that Jesus came into the world was to rescue us from this brokenness and from this darkness. Jesus came preaching about a kingdom of light and a kingdom of life. And he made clear to us that the kingdom of this world is not only broken, but its ultimate destination is death. And our only hope of escape is to change our citizenship, to move from this kingdom into his kingdom where there is life. In Colossians 1.13, Paul made very clear the reason Jesus came was to deliver us from the dominion of darkness and place us into his kingdom where there is life. That's what the work of Jesus was all about in delivering us and giving us an opportunity to move toward life. Now, Jesus was under no illusion that his work was going to be easy. Not for a minute did he think that the powers of darkness were just going to roll over when he arrived and hand him this world with a bow on top. No, Jesus understood that he was in for a fight, that it was going to be a battle, and it would ultimately be a battle that would cost his life, but it was a price he was willing to pay. He not only made clear that it was going to be a battle for him, but anyone who would pledge their allegiance to Christ could expect to be in the battle as well. One of the things I love about Jesus is that he never pulls any punches. He's always right up front. He says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be in my kingdom, you better be prepared to take up a cross. You better be prepared to suffer. You better be prepared to die. He was giving us that heads up in verses 10 and 11 when he let us know part of kingdom living, part of the blessing of kingdom living is persecution. It comes with the territory. I think it's particularly important for those of us who live here in the United States, though, to get a handle on what Jesus meant by persecution. Because you and I are blessed beyond all reason to live in a land of complete freedom. We worship without fear. We proclaim the name of Jesus without fear, with no inhibition whatsoever. And persecution has not, by and large, come our way. Perhaps there have been instances here and there, but for the most part, we've had freedom of religion and freedom to worship as we choose. And I think sometimes we feel a little guilty about that because we know that other believers around the world are undergoing persecution and we do want to identify with them in some way and perhaps in a feeble attempt to assuage our conscience, we will widen the notion of persecution. Jesus' understanding of persecution was very narrow. In this passage, he only gives us two qualifiers, those who are persecuted for righteousness and those who are persecuted because of him. Brings it right down, very narrow. And that eliminates other events in life that we might be inclined to identify as persecution. Sometimes very silly and absurd things. For example, uh, this past Christmas season, you know, I, I don't care what you saw anybody post on Facebook. If some big company decided to say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, that was not persecution. <laughs> not by a long shot. But there are folks who run around with their hair on fire, acting as though it were. Neither is persecution a failure to get what we want, not getting our way. This is a broken world. Things don't always go our way. Jobs are lost. People get sick and die. Relationships come to an end. Children make bad choices. On and on and on and on. 
And just because things don't unfold the way we wanted them to, the way we hoped, planned, expected, that doesn't necessarily mean it was persecution. What it probably means is that we are broken people living in a broken world. Most significantly though, I would point out that neither is persecution living with the consequences of our own bad behavior. Years ago, I worked with a fellow who was very vocal about his faith in the workplace. We worked in a large office area and he made sure everybody knew that he was a Christ follower and that his goal in life was to one day be a pastor of a church. And that was fine so far as it went. But unfortunately, in addition to being a vocal Christian, he was also probably one of the most obnoxious human beings I've ever known in my life. (laughs) Temperamental, judgmental, impatient, unkind snap at people in a heartbeat. Conflict just followed him around like the plague. And when I would see one of these episodes of his with anger and unkind, it just, I would just cringe thinking, oh my goodness, I hope they are not drawing their conclusions about Jesus based on him. Well, one day his anger and his temper and his outburst went just a little too far and the bosses took notice of it and he got a written Reprimand. And I can still see him in my mind's eye coming down the corridor there towards my desk, waving this reprimand in his hand, coming up to me and saying, do you know why I got this? And I'm thinking to myself, because you're an idiot. (laughs) He said, I got this because I'm not afraid to speak out for Jesus. Wrong. We do dumb things, all of us. We do sinful things. And sin usually has consequences. That doesn't count as persecution. So what is it? Well, I suppose it comes in all sorts of ways into our lives, but I'll share with you about some friends of mine who have known it according to the qualifiers that Jesus gives us here. About three years ago, Dylan Lucas and I had the opportunity to go to the Philippines, down to the southern tip of the islands known as Mindanao. Mindanao has been in a civil war since the 1970s. Communist insurgents have been trying to overthrow the country. And about six years ago, ISIS decided to join the party. And so it has been a dangerous place, particularly for Christians, because neither the communists nor ISIS care for them. And we had dinner one night with a pastor who told us about a Sunday evening worship service in which his gathered people were there praising God, and suddenly they realized the building was on fire. ISIS had set it on fire. And as they scrambled to get out for their lives, ISIS was positioned to shoot them. By God's grace, no one died, but there was plenty of injuries and plenty of fear and plenty of persecution. They were gathered there because of Jesus. I have a friend in India whose ministry is a traveling evangelist. He goes about the countryside into rural villages, preaching the gospel. One day, he made his way into a little village, and the villagers there were devoted to a particular Hindu god, and the village elders liked it that way because they profited from the devotion to this god, and they had no interest in another god coming along and stealing their profits. And in order to persuade my friend to move along Not only did they stab him, but they shot him. And by the grace of God, he managed to crawl out of the jungle to his truck and get to a hospital. He was doing it for Jesus. I know a man in Eastern Europe. He's been a pastor a long time. And back when the Soviet Union still dominated so much of that part of the world, his little country was under their thumb 
He served as a pastor of a little church and spoke boldly the name of Jesus despite the communist doctrine and oppression. And on more than one occasion in the middle of the night, the KGB would show up and take him to some unknown location, unknown to his family, where he would be beaten and interrogated and reminded there is no God and there is no Jesus and you quit talking about him. But he kept on talking about him because he loved Jesus. You know, prior to meeting these kinds of people, I used to read this particular passage, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted and think to myself, what? Maybe I'm missing something here, Jesus, but I'm not seeing the upside. I mean, physical harm, perhaps even leading to death, mental and emotional harm, it doesn't sound like much of a blessing to me until I got to know these people. And as I have gotten to know them, I've been able to see that in fact there is a tremendous blessing that comes with it because I see in them a depth of commitment and devotion and love for our Lord that I don't often see in other places that I don't see enough in my own heart and in my own life. Not only do I see a resilience there, a determination to stay the course and to be faithful and to continue to preach the gospel. But I see something else that's evidence of blessing. I see a softness of heart. These people have not become embittered or cynical or unforgiving of their persecutors. No, if anything, they are becoming more and more like Jesus. More able to say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. There was a love and a joy and a peace there. You could go down the descriptors that we've been talking about these last six weeks and see them quite clearly in their lives. I would stand there in amazement. Yes, there is a blessing that comes with persecution. And my admiration for these people knows no bounds. But I would be less than honest with you if I didn't tell you In addition to my admiration, I also had a sense of guilt. It just didn't seem very fair. I mean, here are these faithful men and women who already, most of them living in poverty, on top of that then are persecuted for their faith. Meanwhile, I, living in the most prosperous nation in the history of the world, having never known a single moment of persecution, not even really knowing what it is, and not staying up at night wondering or worrying about it. Sometimes it was just hard for me to make sense of that. Didn't seem to be a whole lot of fairness there. And I felt guilt. Until one day, I got a little insight that I hadn't had before. And it came from the most unlikely of places. You know, all truth is God's truth. And sometimes he can use the most out of the way, unusual things to open our eyes to truth, even in scripture. And the thing that gave me insight into this passage was a page from a book called The Lord of the Rings. Early in that story, the young protagonist, a fellow by the name of Frodo Baggins, finds himself in a horrible situation. Through no fault of his own, he can see destruction and death on the horizon coming not only for him, but also for everyone that he loves. And in a deep, sense of fear and anguish, he cries out to his mentor and guide, the wizard Gandalf. He says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. To which Gandalf says, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. 
All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. Boom. My eyes were opened. And I realized Jesus is not calling me to go out and hunt for persecution. There are some things in this life that we don't get to decide. Foremost among them, where we're born. I did not choose to be born in the United States any more than my friends chose to be born in the Philippines, India, or Eastern Europe. I didn't choose to grow up in a land where there are unbounded freedoms any more than they chose to grow up in lands of persecution. And I began to understand, instead of feeling guilty and worrying about the degree of persecution in my life over which I have no control, the better use of my time and energy was to focus on what I did have control over. And namely, that was my desire, my willingness to be salt and light. Jesus follows up this last beatitude with a reminder that that is our primary responsibility as believers. We're not responsible for so many other things in our lives, but this one, without a doubt. Are we living lives of saltiness and light? Are we stopping the decay around us? Are we a preservative in this broken world? Are we a light in the darkness? Or have we covered it up? To my friends who have suffered persecution, Jesus says, don't be so afraid of persecution that you lose your saltiness and light. But to us, I think he gives an even greater warning. To those of us who live here in the United States of America, he says, don't let your freedoms cause you to lose your saltiness and your light. We can become lazy, apathetic, uncaring Christians, taking for granted the freedoms that we have. And instead of being good stewards of these freedoms, of this time, this opportunity that we have to proclaim the name of Jesus loudly and without fear, to live gracious and winsome lives among our friends and our family members, our coworkers, our classmates, instead of taking advantage of that unbelievable blessing that we have so often, we sink back into apathy And we're more concerned about our possessions. And we're more concerned about Netflix. And we're more concerned about our bank account. Or you fill in the blank. Jesus is not going to hold us accountable for the fact that we were born here. But he is going to hold us accountable for how we chose to live here. And what will we say when we stand before him one day? Will we be able to say with confidence, I was salty for you, Lord. I kept my light shining for you, Lord. Or will we have to say something else? When I think about my brothers and sisters around the world who are in fact suffering for the sake of the gospel, Sometimes I remind myself, Dan, if for no other reason than to honor them, can't you step up and be salt and light? Can't you honor their suffering by using your freedom in ways that would honor God and ways that would expand the kingdom? This sermon series has been a wonderful reminder for all of us of how we are to live. Right off the bat, when Jesus begins preaching this sermon, he begins to outline for us, this is what it means to be my disciple. This is what you should look like. And miracle of miracles, friend, 
we can live these things out in complete and total freedom. There is no one holding us back but us. And what a shame it would be if after this sermon series, we just closed our Bibles up and said, you know, that was good. Let's move on to the next thing. And we didn't stop and give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to shape us, to help us understand poverty of spirit, to be merciful, to be meek, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to be a person who's pure in heart, to be someone, even if we're not being persecuted in the moment, knows there are others who are, and to honor them and to love our Lord Jesus, we will be salt and light where we can. I think that's the call of God upon us today here at Faith Bridge. This is a season that God gave us. We live here in Southeast Texas in this time and we have opportunities afforded to us that will never come again. God help us not miss a single one to be salt and light for him. I want us to close today in a time of um, prayer. You can stay seated if you want. You're certainly welcome to come down front, but I think here at the conclusion of this series, it would be a good time just to sort of drive a stake in the ground. And if we've already made a commitment to Jesus, let's, let's recommit, let's remind ourselves, yeah, this is what I'm about. Perhaps I've let that slide. And I just need this little space of time right here to be reminded, yeah, I'm a kingdom citizen. So we're gonna pray and give God a chance to forgive us and help us recommit. Or if you're here and maybe you're hearing about this whole Jesus thing for the first time, but your eyes are being opened I wanna pray for you too, that you can move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And we can leave here today reassured of God's great love for us and re-energized to go into a broken, dark, decaying world and be the salt and the light that he's called us to be, amen. After I pray, we're gonna, we're gonna sing a song and I'm gonna ask you to please stay and let, let's use the singing of the song as a part of our devotion. And once we've sung the song, uh, Lizzie here in the West and, and Matthew in the East will dismiss us. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come before you this morning, on the one hand, so very glad and so very thankful for the freedoms we have. Not one of us woke up this morning and wondered if it would be safe to be here. We just got in our cars and we came. Thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that you'd forgive us for the times that we took it for granted. Forgive us for the times that we forgot there are men and women and boys and girls around this globe who are suffering and some are even dying because of their love for you. Lord, forgive us of our apathy and place within us a renewed spirit. Help us, Lord, to leave here today looking at the world differently, thinking about the world differently, allowing you to live your life through us so that we can be the person that you've created us to be and make the impact you want us to make. If you're here today, and your eyes are just being opened to the reality of Jesus and his kingdom, 
we want to invite you to come in. And all you have to do is say to the king, I want to belong to you. Please accept me into your kingdom. And he will receive you with open arms. Lord, we do love you. And we do want to be faithful with all the opportunities we have. We offer our prayer this morning in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.